The purpose of this presentation is to really underscore oral reading fluency, what it represents and what has to happen for it to come about, what it really, really indicates. It's quite fascinating, I think, and there is a tendency to think of it, though, as reading fast, and this is completely understandable considering that when we measure reading fluency, we time it. So, absolutely easy to see why educators and even children think that fluency is all about speed. This presentation, I hope to show you uh, the research and some of the evidence that reading fluency is so much more. Once the knowledge of what, re um, what oral reading fluency really means is understood, then interventions usually can begin to be effective. All right. As always in these presentations, we open with one or two sources to reference. I don't have a copy of one of them here, but either way, for more information once this presentation is done, and to maybe highlight where a lot of the material came from, <clears throat> you can check these out. Dr. Jan Hasbrook, renowned researcher in the area of fluency, and the reference seen here, that blue and yellow book, is actually a set of four booklets. They're really, really quite good. She's so admired for her expertise in this area and her ability to make things regarding fluency clear and logical are just amazing. The second thing listed here is an article that two colleagues and I wrote <clears throat> that will illustrate many of the points you'll see in this presentation. Most definitions of fluency include two common elements, word recognition and comprehension. And if we were to search for definitions of fluency and pile them all one on top of each other somehow, we would get the point that when oral reading of words on a page is accurate and quick and easy, then comprehension is able to occur. A lot of people picture fluency as a bridge, which may make us think of it as a linear thing, like first we have to decode, learn to decode words, and then we get more accurate and fast at that word reading piece, and then we can comprehend. I would suggest that while that is true to some degree, fluency is actually the two together. For early readers, decoding accuracy is the most significant contributor to comprehension. Then as they get more accurate, the rate and accuracy become significant. For skilled readers who are comprehending the text, the comprehension itself can serve to guide expression or prosody. I heard a lot of common misconceptions related to fluency and speed from many people. Yet, again, it's quite understandable why they exist. First of all, the definitions of fluency include those words, speed or rate. Um, so it's no wonder when people think fluency is all about speed. And then, to improve fluency, what we should do is do things that help students read faster. Um, fluent reading isn't fast reading. I'm going to go back now and reread what I just said to you with my fastest reading. I have heard a common misconception related to fluency and speed for many people, yet it's quite a display of why these exist. First of all, they include the word speed and rate. Okay. Um, was that more fluent sounding to read fast? No. Okay. So, um, now I have to go back to where I was. <laughs> I didn't sound fluent because, like Stahl and Kuhn, that resource there at the bottom of the page, pointed out, fluent reading really sounds like speech. And we don't speak quickly like that. So if fluency is not at all about speed, then why do we even include the words speed or rate in our definitions? All right, well, there has to be a reasonable amount of rate, again, enough so that reading sounds similar to speech, and without it, comprehension is all but lost. There's gonna be more on this on the next slide. Okay, um, but first, another point to be made here regarding that speed thing, and I hear this one a lot, a lot, a lot. People get quite distraught by the way fluency is measured with a timing device. You know, we use our phone or stopwatch or something. Again, no wonder people think fluency is all about speed when we assess it with a timing device. When we're assessing, we typically use that subtest everyone knows as ORF, Oral Reading Fluency, O-R-F. And we have students read for 60 seconds using a grade level passage and we note the number of correctly read words that they read in 60 seconds. 
that's the raw number. So that raw number of words, the rate, has actually over three decades of research showing that it is highly, highly correlated with reading comprehension, especially when students are um, below grade six. More on this in a couple slides too, but let's just say that since we measure or assess fluency by timing it, that makes many, many people think that the time, the be all and the end all is speed. I've heard people dismiss fluency entirely saying, ah, reading is about meaning. It's not how fast you can read words. So we don't measure fluency. And I've seen people helping children practically memorize those passages by having them read them and reread them and practice them over and over so they can get a higher score. No, no, no. So these misconceptions um, lead to poor literacy assessment practices, poor instructional practices, and then I would just want to say interestingly, in their commentary on reading fluency assessment, Hasp and Suchi, 2014, said that ORF actually doesn't measure fluency. After all, fluency is more than that rate thing. Instead, they said it's actually a measure of automaticity. Automaticity, indicating how proficiently and easily a student can read. Proficiency in reading is so important. Let's keep that in mind. All right, so if it's not about speed, how should we define fluency? Hasbrook and Glaser's 2012 definition is fantastic. They took the familiar textbook definition of reading that everyone learns. Fluency is the ability to read a text accurately, quickly, and with expression. And then they amended it to make it much, much more accurate. So, here it is on this slide. It's reasonably accurate reading at an appropriate rate with suitable prosody expression that leads to accurate and deep comprehension and motivation to read. So reasonably accurate reading, perfect. Why? Because 100% accuracy might not always be needed. It's necessary when reading a medicine bottle or maybe a, a, an assembly manual of some kind, but Rosinski and colleagues suggested that accurately reading like 95 to 98% of words is enough to main comp maintain comprehension of most texts. And this is provided um, that other aspects of fluency are intact. So let's consider the next part of this great definition. Appropriate rate. This segment surprises many. Um, once we have calculated the rate, the raw score, number of words, um, read in one minute, reading grade level text, we can compare it to benchmarks at the um, same grade level. So what fluency rate are we looking to get? We know from lots and lots of research that a rate below 50th percentile is correlated with impaired comprehension. You're reading too many, too slowly to make sense of what you're seeing. That'll be on the next slide. What's surprising is that although it seems that a rate, say, in the 90th percentile would be really awesome and desirable, there isn't research to support that this would mean better comprehension than someone reading at the 50th percentile. We've all seen some students reading so fast that their comprehension actually suffers for it. So again, fast, fast, fast is not better. So that's why I love the word appropriate in this definition, and it makes us remember this, an appropriate rate. Um, once when I was discussing fluency with a colleague who really viewed fluency only about speed, rationalized not needing speeding, speed to me, she said something like, I know a lot of students who aren't fast readers. They get their work done. Well, of course, everyone is different. Some of my friends are fast walkers, and some are slow walkers, fast talkers, slow talkers. Uh, the fast walkers and the slow walkers, they're both going to get to their destination. I would only like to point out one thing, because I hate to give an inch and then have someone go a mile down the wrong road. If my colleague's students are reading, say, at a rate of mm, about... 80 words a minute versus the average college student's rate of about 200 words a minute, yeah, they're all going to get through their assigned chapters in those textbooks. But think about it. If the chapter has, say, 20,000 words, it'll take the student who reads 80 words a minute over four hours to read that chapter. The student reading 200 words a minute is going to have that chapter read in about an hour and a half. So when it comes to tackling homework, building or maintaining stamina, maintaining interest and motivation, and even reading more, which leads to more learning overall, we can see that speed does matter in a sense. So when kids get to middle school, high school, and they can't read fluently, uh, 
at an appropriate rate, those books and assignments, they start staying in the lockers. They're not, they're not going home in the backpack. There's just not enough hours in the day to do it all. Um, <clears throat> research shows that students who can read fluently read more books independently, but realistically, just the 50th percentile is the goal for comprehension. Anything more is fine, it's great, but the rate has to be appropriate for the task. task excuse me. <clears throat> The next part of this definition are next parts are suitable prosody. And instead of just saying prosody, it makes clear that prosody has to be suitable for the text. We don't want to be reading a scientific journal, say, with expression we might use when we're reading a fairy tale. Um, a fantastic addition to the definition of fluency is motivation. That other part there. Surely, if you're able to read words on the page accurately and so automatically that there's a speech-like pace and suitable expression, you'll not only gain meaning, but reading's going to be pleasurable and motivating. All right, so next slide. <clears throat> There's no lack of research examining the positive correlations between oral reading fluency and comprehension. This slide just shows a teensy sample of what's out there. Um, the research done in studies such as these are also what led to Hasbrook and Tyndall's assertion that a fluency rate in the 50th percentile is that appropriate level for comprehension to happen. So let's just stop for a second and make an explicit connection between fluency and why it's so connected to comprehension. Laberge and Samuels, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but two psychologists published a really classic study way back in 1974 in which they showed that to get automatic in reading, there needs to be automaticity, no effort, at the subskill levels underneath. Letters, sounds, decoding, phoneme awareness, and so on. And they described that the conscious attention required when processing letters and sounds and decoding rules and those things leaves the new reader, especially, with very little cognitive attention left for comprehension. But once those subskills become automatic, once reading words is easy, effortless, uh, it requires little to no conscious attention, the reader then has enough attention to give to comprehension. So it's obvious that fluency, it's obvious that fluency is correlated with comprehension. The more automatic we are at reading the words, at decoding, the more gas we have left in the tank to drive comprehension. Even um, a speed or rate at the 50th percentile while not the fastest, it's going to be enough to free up the mind to listen to and understand what's being read. So here's a simulation for you to try. <laughs> I'd recommend pausing this video right here, just hit the pause button, so that you can take as much time as you need to do it. And all you have to do is orally read this passage. As you can see, I've printed the words really differently. Instead of left to right, they go top to bottom. So just start upper left and read down starting with the word these. When you're done, you can hit play again to resume this. It's great if you can time yourself to see how long it takes you. Okay, so how'd you do? If you're like everyone else who has tried this, your fluency was pretty low. You likely made a lot of mistakes or even missed a line altogether. I've seen that happen. Tell me, can you explain what the passage was about? Probably not. You're probably scoffing and saying, no. This is because your cognitive attention was drawn to the words. You had to figure out how to what those words were and sound them out. Your brain's not used to reading top down, so it had to pay more attention to the letters and sounds and putting them together. You had to depend on context a lot to support what the next word was. You probably, if you read it out loud, sounded monotone, and you were most definitely slow, and you're probably frustrated, and you're probably not motivated. And I hope you timed yourself because now you're going to read it again. Alright, this time here, read it again, stop it if you want to, time yourself. And this time you'll probably be able to tell someone what the passage is about because you can comprehend it. Um, it's likely reasonably accurate, you didn't skip lines or make mistakes, and you probably had a nice appropriate rate with suitable prosody that led to accurate and deep comprehension and maybe and hopefully motivation to read. This time, if you read it this way, you're fluent because you didn't need to pay attention to the words. Was it because you read faster that you comprehended? No. It's because you read easier. You read easier. And due to the fact that you could read easier, your reading just so happened to be faster. 
So, when it comes to fluency, no one is saying it's important to read fast. If they do, they're wrong. What we're saying is that it's important to read easy and easily. And <laughs> because when we read with ease, we're able to read more words within a little time limit. That, so that's why it's a great way to measure how easy reading is. It's a great way to measure how easy reading is becoming when we give an intervention to. All right, so this is just a cartoon visual for you here, kind of a metaphor for trying to make a student become fluent using strategies that encourage faster reading, more natural sounding reading, etc. Why is the student not reading fluently? That's the question to ask. It's the proverbial cart before the horse. All right, choose any one of these clip art um, images on this next slide and consider what it takes to become fluent with the activity. For each one of these, there are discrete sub-skills underneath that the operator or performer has to become adept at, having to perform many of them at the same time. Observe a three-year-old soccer player, a bunch of them, who haven't learned how to kick or handle the ball or stop the ball with various parts of their bodies and who haven't learned the rules of the game like scoring or what offsides means and, or how to pass and maneuver and then observe an elite adult FIFA game. I mean, the difference is so evident, right? Because the more fluent adult players have a command of those subskills. The game proceeds smoothly with great speed and grace. It's easy for them. Keyboarding, or operating a combination lock, or operating an adding machine. The first few times we're slow. We're, we're halting, we're prone to lots of errors. Eventually, we don't give any thought to any of it. Fluency with those underlying subskills and everything we do in life means it becomes easy and then speed is the result. So fluency can only be a result. It's not something we can't we can start with. We can't say, oh, your keyboarding skills are slow. You're only typing 12 words a minute. We need to see 80. Go faster and then expect someone to just go faster. No, we need to work on finger placement, muscle memory, you know, where the pinkies go and so on until those things are easier and then fluency evolves. It's a byproduct. It's a result of everything else working smoothly. <clears throat> we cannot say to our students who don't find reading words easy, listen to how I read. See how it's supposed to sound? Now read like that, faster and with nice expression. We can't because they'll try, um, but their cognitive energy still has to pay attention to the words. Make that part easier, and then they're going to be more fluent. All right, so typically we see instruction to address fluency as involving some kind of repeated practice of reading and rereading text, practicing phrases, and so on. This is great. Practice reading and rereading text are, is certainly going to make reading <clears throat> more fluent of that text. We have to consider, though, are they reading it more fluently because they're remembering how it goes, or are they actually reading those words with more ease? If we take the words out of the text and write them on cards, and we give them to the student and have them read those words with ease. This, by the way, is, I would just want to say here, the, why the Common Core State Standards are spe specify that students have to be able to read words not only in context but in isolation because the text is supportive and it hides, it, as to hide the student, you know, it's using it as a crutch. Anyway, repeated readings may also work because of repeated exposure to words and that's going to help students in subsequent texts when those words appear again. All right, so no one would ever say that repeated readings is something to avoid. No, I'm not saying that. No one's saying that. But if we're trying to make reading words easier, which will absolutely help make reading all texts that students try to read more fluent and more easy to comprehend, we have to say, or we have to see why the fluency and comprehension is wobbly. So it's like this table here what foundational skills are missing or still requiring a lot of effort. Give an alphabetic assessment and you might find the student doesn't really know their digraph sounds automatically with ease. Give a decoding assessment and you might find they get hung up on say the silent E pattern or they get hung up on words with vowel teams. That's a real common one. Uh, give an assessment of phoneme awareness that includes having them manipulate the phonemes and you're going to probably find they're not proficient at that very often. Um, for more insights on these few things I just mentioned, you can go to the presentations on the simple view of reading. Um, it's also in the presentation on phoneme awareness and the presentation on orthographic mapping. So they're all tied together. All right, the bottom line here, based on the research evidence, 
and the true meaning of fluency is that we have to make sure the student can read the words with ease. Educators often hear this, acknowledge it, and then they're kind of disinclined to change the focus of instruction to words. I get it. Um, the, they might even tell me reasons for being reluctant to do so. I'm not really sure what to do to teach phoneme awareness or decoding. Okay, super cool, that's honest, you know, and it's a real common issue. Let's help you to figure out what to do. Reach out to someone in your building who knows or brainstorm how to get that knowledge. Start by watching other presentations in the series. Um, I have some really amazing sources you can check out. Um, another reason is uh, maybe they're unsure how to restructure an ELA block or get the necessary materials or resources or how to group. Yeah, it is very complicated and a lot of work to shift fluency work to the words instead of what you've always done maybe. But if educators team up to put that work into it, they almost always find that the teaching gets so much better and it even feels easier and the students are achieving more with a lot less teaching effort. Um, it's easier in the short run to just have students reread text, uh, do a reduce, reduce theater, use or I'm sorry, computer programs that have a lot of text rereading and so on. But if fluency is like stagnant, if it likely means that reading words is going to remain is remaining stagnant. School districts will show me oral reading uh, fluency data over a period of a few years, like the data that I have pictured here, and they'll, they'll express frustration. Only 30, 40, say 50 percent of the students have fluency rates at benchmark. Those are the figures in this example here in green. And the students in yellow and red are the students performing poorly on the state tests, and that makes sense because if you struggle to read, you're not fluent, and if you struggle to read, you can't comprehend, and if you struggle to read, you can't get through the questions on a state test easily. You probably comprehend just fine if something is read to you, but it takes you so long and takes so much concentration that the meaning of the text is lost. When the schools um, then turn to implement programs to boost phoneme awareness, proficiency, decoding skills, and so on, those underlying skills, the fluency sc scores start to go in the right direction, up, up, up. The data printouts show these triangles become mostly green, with just a little yellow at the top and sometimes little to even no red, meaning no tier three. That means fewer kids not at grade level and more attention for them too, they're in smaller groups. So it takes work, it's worth the commitment of doing it, even if it takes a few years to get it just right. I often hear, I hate timing kids when they read. I like to let them read the whole passage and listen to their reading. Okay, fluency is best measured with a time limit. I know, because it sets the same standard or limit around everyone. Everyone gets 60 seconds to read, everyone. And then we can see who was able to read just a few words in that small window of 60 seconds and who could read a ton of words in that window. Fewer words means word reading isn't easy, obviously. Having the child read the whole passage defeats the whole purpose. A, you can do that any other time if you want to. <clears throat> B, there isn't enough time in a school day to listen to all the children um, read for what could be many, many minutes. C, it's actually cruel if the child struggles to make them read through the whole thing. And D, your data, your data excuse me, are going to be rendered meaningless. So you'll have nothing to compare to. So by timing it, 60 second gates, we get a quick assessment quick of overall reading health, similar to like a thermometer giving us a temperature of our physical health. The number on the thermometer has to be interpreted. The reason for the number being low and fluency has to be investigated. It's not due to knowing letters, is it due to not knowing letter sounds or phoneme awareness and we have to dig deeper. Anyway, think of fluency assessments as what they really are, measures of automaticity. And here's an analogy, pretend you're a swimming coach and both, I use this analogy all the time, both Michael Phelps and I apply to be on your team. You haven't got all day, but you want to see how well we swim first. We each jump in, you blow the whistle, we swim as far as we can in 60 seconds. I'm personally glad you're not having me swim for a half hour because I'm going to drown. All right, so I was able to complete 18 freestyle strokes, say. Wow. Michael Phelps, on the other hand, I don't even know, he might complete, say, 68. He's going to be allowed to go get a bite to eat, but the, then you need to assess what I'm doing. I stay in the water. You look at my kicking. 
you assess my arm and hand movements. You assess how I move my head and breathe. You help me get more automatic with all of those skills, with some lessons and some coaching. You work on those underlying skills, my breathing, my arms, my kick, for a few weeks. And then you have me jump in the pool and swim again for 60 seconds to monitor my progress. Yay, I'm not swimming 30 freestyle strokes in 60 seconds. It's, it's not about how fast I'm swimming. It's about how much easier swimming is getting for me. I can then do more of it. So I'm less frustrated. I probably won't drown now. <laughs> all right. So these are all standardized measures of oral reading fluency commonly used in schools. Ames Web, Dibbles, Easy CBM, FAST. Standardized means they're given in the same manner to all students. Standardization <clears throat> is needed so that the score we get is meaningful and can be compared to the scores of students at the same grade level, all of whom were given the assessment in the same way. Just like we have a standardized, standardized currency system, we use dollars, we don't use chickens and tomatoes. And just like we have standardized weights or measures, a pound or a cup or a tablespoon is the same for all of us. Standardization just means the same for everyone. Don't confuse this with high stakes testing. So you can't be against standardized tests because you're equating them with high stakes tests. That's not the same thing. Standardized tests have been proven for decades to be reliable. What does that mean? That means that if we give them to students every few months or even every couple of weeks like these, uh, the scores aren't going to be all over the place. A child's not going to score 13 words in a minute today and then give them two in two weeks another one and it's nine, they're not going to get 90 words because the developers tested these passages on thousands and thousands of kids to make sure that a, a grade two passage is similar in difficulty to another grade two passage. Um, they've also been proven for decades to be valid. What does this mean? This means that they measure what they're supposed to. We're looking to see how automatic a student reads. We're looking to see the likelihood that this student is going to meet future benchmarks. Oral reading fluency is highly correlated with future reading achievement. Valid and reliable assessments. Okay, as a last reminder, in case I haven't said it enough, uh, I hope that you now have a more fluent, deep understanding of what fluency is, what it means, what it indicates, and why it's important. School curriculum teams should make sure that all teachers share these common understandings of fluency so that the goals for instruction and assessment can be in alignment. All right. Well, that was a little bit on fluency. Thank you really very much for participating and watching this. Here's my contact information if you have questions at all or have any comments. I hope you're going to watch some more in these series. Like I said, there's a few that are really connected to this topic. Um, and have insights to the one you just watched here. All right, thank you very much.